Greetings and welcome to the Saco City Council meeting for Monday, March 8th, 2021. Call the meeting to order at 6.31 p.m. Uh, let the record reflect that the council members, uh, all council members are present, including the city administrator uh, with the vacancy uh, of Ward 5. With that, we are at item three. I'd like to invite everybody to join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. The flag is located behind City Administrator Kaner. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everybody. With that, we are at item four on the agenda. Uh, 4A is a call for letters of interest for Ward 5 Council vacancy. Uh, the City of Saco is now accepting letters of interest from Ward 5 residents who wish to serve on the City Council uh, for the remainder of Council of Minthorn's term, expiring December of 2021. Council of Minthorn resigned on February 22, 2021 uh, Council meeting. And the Council has accepted his resignation at the March 1, 2021 meeting. Interested candidates must submit letters of interest to Michelle Hughes, City Clerk, at mhughes at sancomain.org or the City Clerk's office at Saco City Hall, 300 Main Street, by 4 p.m. on Wednesday, March 24th, 2021. The submissions from interested candidates will be reviewed and discussed publicly during the City Council meeting on April 5th. To learn more about the responsibilities of a City Councilor or to view the board map, please visit, visit sacomain.org slash city council. Thank you. We are at uh, item, uh, excuse me, item five, committee correspondence to council. Are there any committee correspondence at this time? I see no committee correspondence. Uh, that brings us to item six, public comments. City Administrator Canrath, have we received any public comment for tonight's meeting? I don't have anything sp uh, submitted specifically for public comment. However, I will remind the council that you all received uh, a number of emails regarding action item E, uh, the flag pond road parcels um, on tonight's agenda. So those were emailed to the entire council over the past week or so. So just as long as everyone has received those emails, um, those did come in, but they were not submitted specifically for public comment for me to read. Thank you. Thank you, City Administrator Kinnerath. At this time, I'll open up to uh, public comment. Anyone wishing to speak to the, uh, to the council on a specific topic, please use the raise hand feature of the Zoom platform, and you'll be unmuted to speak to the council. Uh, up first is Zoom identifier, Kevin Southern. Kevin, you've been allowed to uh, unmute. Please go ahead and do so. State your name and address for the record and present your comments to council. Uh, please remember the three minute time. Limit. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, my name is Kevin Sutherland, 15 North Street. I'm disappointed the council chose not to move to a public hearing the zoning revision item related to the Lincoln Bradley Street parcel to a higher density use a few weeks ago. Tonight would have been the ideal time to help the neighborhood and the larger community better understand the need to further develop sites like this, as its proximity to downtown, where infrastructure already exists, would provide a stronger tax base, ultimately subsidizing taxes per acre elsewhere in our city. Uh, MDR, or as the zone prescribes, single family homes are a downward trend throughout the country and even in our region. And I'm not the only consultant preaching this. The consultants that you're working with that are also working with our comprehensive plan committee addressed this as part of their presentation back in January. I hope going forward, our zoning reflects the ideas and recommendations that are part of the approved comprehensive plan. This is the only way SACO can sus be sustainable for the long term. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Up next. 
We have Zoom identifier, Mark Galos. Mark, you've been allowed to unmute. Please go ahead and do so. State your name and address for the record and present your comments to the council. A uh, reminder, there is a three minute time. Okay, first of all, can you hear me? I'm not, I'm not so good on the Zoom stuff. We can hear you. Okay, great, great. Guys, I, I'm calling up and I, I'm coming in a little uh, unprepared, unfortunately. I'm out of town and uh, I, I realized this uh, thing was tonight. Uh, I've, uh, my, my question is, uh, is simply on the Portland Road zone. We, uh, I've been, I've, I, I have about 100 acres of uh, land around there that I was planning on developing. Uh, I've, I've spent probably the last two, two years uh, with the developer and, uh, and, and lawyers and everybody else and the engineers and so forth on this thing, spent tens of thousands of dollars on this thing. Uh, and I thought we were on, on a track to, uh, to make this a mixed use uh, zone. Uh, unfortunately, uh, maybe a few months ago, but apparently the zoning board or the planning council or the city council, somebody was having a late meeting and they decided to change this one back to the way it, it had been for the last, uh, 50 years. And, uh, and we went right back to square one. Uh, my question is this is, uh, at this point, I'm still not really sure, uh, what, what the Portland road zone consists of is it industrial is it business is it mixed use uh i know my neighbor teresa defoss ha, ha, has has some uh, uh things going on over there and uh we've been in obviously in the area for you know last 60 years and uh i think we've been pretty good uh citizens we're just trying to figure out what what we've got and uh so we can have something to work with but again the last two and a half years have been extremely frustrating from the standpoint that we still don't know what we have. And uh, so I, I asked tonight to maybe get some kind of uh, clarification as to exactly what this Portland Road zone means at this point. Can anybody help me on that? Uh, Mark, the public comment section is for a time when it's for you to give your comments to the city council. It's not a Q and A. However, if you have specific questions, around zoning, uh, you mm -hmm. should feel free to call the planning department tomorrow and they can answer all your questions regarding zoning. Sure, sure. All right, well, uh, again, I'm, I'm not trying to be difficult by any stretch of the imagination. We're just trying to get some some clarification and, 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 and be uh, pro-business and, and pro-good uh, citizens and bring some tax tax base to the city of Saco. So we appreciate every, everything you guys are doing for us. I, uh, I know you guys are all working hard and uh, and I appreciate it. So, again, I, I thank you, and, uh, and I'll, I'll give the I'll give the uh, planning board a call or the planning committee a call tomorrow morning. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Thank Thank you very much, guys. Have a good evening. What now? Uh, up next, we have Zoom identifier Cassandra Collin. Cassandra, you've been allowed to unmute. Please go ahead and do so. State your name and address for the record. Present your comments to council and please remember the three minute time. Thank you guys. Um, hi, my name is Cassandra. I'm the owner at 121 Flag Pond Road. And I'd like to start by voicing my concern in regards to the transition of the parcel of land on the frontage of Flag Pond Road from low residential to industrial. And I do think that there is an inconsistent presentation of information. So I guess I'd like to start with that. Um, my neighbor, Katrina Batello at 116 Flag Pond Road received email correspondence from Mr. Hamblin on March 1st. Um, this email was forwarded to Mayor Doyle and it was in regards to the zoning of the parcel of land on the frontage of Flag Pond Road. Katrina shared this correspondence with me. The information indicated that the industrial lot could support three to six buildings and a staff of up to 125 people per day. In the past week, uh, Mr. Clark has initiated correspondence or attempt to communicate with uh, me here at Flag Pond Road 121 um, with the initial attempt being last Thursday, March 4th. I was unavailable at the time, but I did thoroughly read through over the letters. He left at the residence and I was able to communicate with my neighbors who were able to meet with him directly. Upon Mr. Clark speaking with my neighbor, Marilyn Ives at 133 Flag Pond Road, there was evidence of cross communication 
In this conversation between Marilyn and Mr. Clark, he verbally disagreed with the referenced email. Mr. Clark responded to Marilyn, indicating the information from the email via Katrina and the town was not factual and that Mr. Clark proceeded to notion that his lot would not support, would support a much smaller scale of traffic and interruption to Flag Pond Road community. After reading the letters thoroughly from Mr. Clark, I'm concerned with paragraph number five from his first letter, and I'm not sure if you guys have access to his letters, um, but it does quote, at that time and continuously since 2009, we have understood from multiple city employees and representatives that the access from the industrial land we purchased was available and allowed from Flag Pond Road. So, I feel like the planning board, I do know that the planning board voted against the conversation, the conversion of the parcel of land from low residential to industrial. So I'm unsure why this letter from Mr. Clark directly implements the understanding of the parcel of land via Flag Pond Road was always available and allowed to him. I feel at this time, it, I feel that the timing and inconsistent presentation of information to the local residents of Flag Pond Road puts us at a disadvantage to make an educated decision. I would like to see that Mr. Clark and the city council readdress the information and come to an agreement on how the land can be used and educate the local residents of Flag Pond Road on how this will impact the ecology, the wildlife, the traffic flow, and the overall development of the neighborhood. Thank you for listening to and considering the needs of Flag Pond Road and the community around us. We're a tight-knit group of families and we are engaged in preserving the land and the community around us. Thank you, Cassandra. Uh, up next, we have Zoom identifier, Jeff Brochu. Jeff, you've been allowed to uh, unmute. Please go ahead and do so. State your name and address for the record and present your comments to council. And again, please remember the three minute timer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor um, and ladies and gentlemen of the council. My name is Jeff Brochu. I reside at 257 Buxton Road. Um, just wanted to comment briefly on your action item B, um, which has to do with the chapter 81 process for the Camp Ellis parcels. Um, just wanted to point out, I'm sure that you're all aware, we have many, many documents that we all try to uh, continuously guide the city by. I mean, the 2018 comprehensive plan, um, approximately page 170, the land use implementation strategies in section six um, has um, an activity that says, review existing open space, city owned parcels, stream corridors, and parcels enrolled in state taxation programs with the goal of establishing a green belt of linked undeveloped spaces for recreation, environmental and wildlife preservation. I think we'd all agree that, you know, beachfront access, particularly um, of the seven miles of Saco Bay is, is pretty uh, substantial feature to our community. Um, the comprehensive plan update obviously goes on even further in section seven, more specifically to beach management, line item five. For those properties that have ownership rights, beach side to the lower watermark, the city should continue to obtain access easements for the purpose of ongoing maintenance and repairs. So the comprehensive plan group obviously identified, um, you know, we have continuing issues down there with storm erosion. Um, so for all those reasons where the city is already poised um, and has ownership for these parcels, which could expedite the, um, the repair efforts that may, may need to take place, as well as for all the taxpayers of the city who, you know, help ultimately fund some of those repairs for them to have access um, to that beach area, um, I think would be in the best interest um, to retain those parcels um, for both maintenance and recreational purposes for the city of Saco. Um, those are my comments and thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Jeff. Up next, we have Zoom identifier, Victoria. Victoria, you've been allowed to unmute. Please go ahead and do so. State your name and address for the record and present your comments to council. Please remember the three minute time. 
Hi, good evening. My name is Victoria Frankel. I am the owner at 126 Flag Pond Road. Thank you, Council, for the opportunity to speak tonight. I uh, live directly across from Cassandra, and I echo um, all of her comments. At, at this point, what we've been told by Mr. Clark and some sort of informal correspondence with the city planner from where we sit, it sort of feels like not everybody is on the same page. And I'm just really hoping that if city council decides that spot zoning in a residential area is the best thing for the city of Saco, that this process has been really well thought out and there's a plan um, moving forward. And if there is a plan, I'm hoping that, that we can be privy to that. Um, like Cassandra said, so that everybody's sort of making an informed decision. That said, I'm against the proposed change to industrial zoning at 148 Flag Pond Road. I really feel that, that changing the zoning from low density residential to industrial would fragment our community, which is pretty close knit and we all plan to stay there for the foreseeable future. I know that there's some new housing development um, going on up the street, which I think really will be an asset. However, I don't, I don't see an industrial zone right in the middle of our neighborhood being an asset. We're already subject to light, noise, and air pollution from Route 1 on one side, I-95 on the other, not to mention the heavy commuter traffic that's on Flag Pond Road itself. However, if city council decides this is the best thing for the city of Saco, I'm asking that you deny access from Flag Pond Road to the proposed industrial park. The other concerns I have are, like Cassandra, mainly in regard to the environment. Soil from eroding um, nearby sites is the number one polluter of main rivers, brooks, ponds, and wetlands. And Cascade Brook is a really important part of the Scarborough Marsh ecosystem. So I would feel better if I knew that um, the brook really was being protected and I'm hoping for a little bit more transparency as this process moves along. Those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, next is Zoom identifier, Paul Hurson. Paul, you've been allowed to unmute. Please go ahead and do so. State your name and address for the record and present your comments to council. Please remember the three minute time limit. Okay, uh, Paul Hersey, uh, 117 Flag Pond Road. Um, I think it's been some miscommunication between the planning office and SOCO and Mr. Clark. Uh, I know my wife and I appreciated Mr. Clark making two visits here to our house. One of them was last Thursday, one was yesterday. And uh, yesterday there was a letter that uh, he invited the neighborhood, uh, the neighbors to come meet with him on Sunday, March 14th, to uh, to look over the uh, to look over the site, and uh, this would be a time where we could, uh, I would think, we could uh, ask questions and uh, voice our concerns and and give Mr. Clark a chance to uh, explain uh, what he's proposing. Um, Yesterday, he told my wife and I that it appears to be something smaller than what we were saying earlier, but the information we got earlier came from the city planner's office. So uh, we just like to have everyone on the same page here. So uh, that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I don't see any other hands raised for public comment.
We have two more hands raised. First is uh, Zoom identifier Rand Clark. Rand, you've been uh, allowed to unmute. Please go ahead and do so. State your name and address for the record and present your, your comments to council. Please remember uh, the three minute time limit. Also, uh, you can speak during the public hearing uh, on item E uh, later on in the evening, but this is the general public comment section. Okay. Uh, can you hear me okay? We can hear you okay. Great. Thank you. My wife, Susan, and I are here. And um, we, we appreciate the opportunity for the public hearing. Um, we were not aware that there was questions uh, until maybe a week and a half, two weeks ago. But as soon as we became aware, we... Uh, have gone around to the neighborhood between the Turnpike and Route 1 along Flag Pond Road to try and meet people in person and to answer their questions. The first letter was last week, Thursday, that was an introduction of my wife and I and what it is that is the question that we're being asked, that, that we are asking of the city. And then we went back again and during that time, we uh, asked people what their questions were and had some good conversations. It was uh, <laughs> it was it was kind of eye opening and surprising because we were able to get a copy of a letter that was circulated, and there just was an awful lot of information that was inaccurate. I I don't know why exactly, but it was quite a bit that was inaccurate. So we tried to uh, give factual information to explain that. We've tried to be very, and we are willing to be very transparent. Yesterday was a question and answer letter that answered 11 questions. And um, we have included in each of the letters, our name, our names, our address, our mailing address, our phone number, our email, and of course, our phone number for texting. And we have offered to meet with people to do an on-site walk. We have two meetings scheduled so far with people for on-site meetings. And I think that if people will avail themselves of that, that a lot of the mystery and the question will, will vanish, will go away. In terms of the question that was asked about, um, I think it was number uh, 121 Flag Pond Road in terms of how many people might be there. I have a copy of that answer that was posted on the website. And it says, quote, with no public sewer available at this time, that would be a limiting factor as he'd have to occupy some of the land for septic systems. Then he goes on and, and I am reading this, this is a quote. It says, to be fair to, be fair to Bob, it says, quote, so a wild-eyed guess at best assumes five buildings, each 10,000 to 25,000 square feet and parking space, purely hypothetical, but under such a scenario, there'd be 125 employees. It's assuming and I, I think we have to understand for Bob's sake and anyone else's that there's an awful lot that will not be known until there is a prospective tenant. There is somebody who's interested in that place. And then there'll be a site plan review. Uh, and all of this will be revealed at that time. And there, there is no plan. You know, people suggest that there's a plan that they would like to have privy to. There is zoning. Um, but until we know what that use will be, uh, it's not really possible to say or to do a site plan review. But that process will be done by the planning board. It's very thorough and will be considered at that time. It is a pocket use. And in our letter, in our questions and answers, we explained that there is 12 acres. And once you deduct for setbacks, water retention on site, parking, septic systems, it might be boiled down to eight acres. Mr. So Clark, it, please, please, I hate to interrupt, but you are no, a minute no and a half over the three-minute yes. timeline. Tell you, tell you what, 
uh, I can elaborate more during the other time. But Thank I you. just would ask people to avail themselves of meeting with us, call us, um, and we're happy to answer any questions. Uh, and I, th I think that will take away a lot of the concerns and mystery. Thank you. Up next, we have Zoom identifier, Joni. Joni, you've been allowed to unmute. Please go ahead and do so. State your name and address for the record and present your comments to the city council. Please remember the three minute time. Yes, this is uh, Greg and Johnny at 40 Flag Pond Road. Um, I would just like to first start off, like I'm a big opponent of growth through the city as far as for residential and business, mainly business. Uh, this area of Saco is exploding with residential stuff. And it's nice to see a mix of businesses and residential. Uh, but I am concerned with the, uh, the traffic and I'd like to see more of what the long-term vision is. Um, and I think some thought needs to be, could be put into this. And I, I noticed Mark Galus was on earlier. Um, speaking with Mark over the years, his long-term vision of his 100 acres is to put an industrial park out back um, that wraps around from Route 1 and circles back on Route 1. And maybe this parcel of land could have access to his roadway uh, once the city takes over the roads and the infrastructure in there, I think that would be a good consideration to uh, for this whole area. But I would also like to, you know, find out a little bit more because this North Saco region is becoming a super highway, especially once you get traffic uh, stoplights at the end of the street. Um, it's it's kind of crazy that the traffic and to have an additional 100 cars and then another additional 300 homes slated up in the area uh, is a lot in the infrastructure. And then this area, this industrial park, are they going to tie into the water? Because the water system, I, frankly, I'm not sure could even handle uh, any more put on here because our water pressure is uh, lacking as it is. I have been just barely enough water pressure to uh, keep the furnace and the uh, keep the shower at a good pressure without taking the flow regulators off. So I just through the city council and the planning development and through Mr. Clark, I'd like to see more of what the uh, long-term vision is, uh, the, the five year, 10 year and 50 year plan is. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Greg. Uh, next up, we have uh, Zoom identifier Cassandra Collin. Cassandra, you've been allowed to unmute. Uh, if this is related to uh, the changing uh, the public hearing on zoning map amendment, uh, you may want to wait until we come to that in the agenda, as this is general public comment. But please go ahead and unmute, state your name and address for the record, and present your comments to the city council. Yes, thank you for that. I apologize. I will stay muted for now. Thank you. Last call for public comment. Moving on from public comment. We are now at item seven of the agenda, uh, approval of the minutes. For February 8th and February 22nd, 2021, is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. Councilor McPhail, is there a second? Second. Councilor Gunn. Discussion on the minutes. Roll call vote on the minutes. Councilor Archer. Aye. Councilor Purdy? Yes. Councilor Dunn? Yes. Councilor Berman? Yes. Councilor McPhail? Yes. Councilor Johnston? No. Motion passes 5 1, approving of the minutes. Moving on to item eight of the agenda, 
consent items. There are several consent items on the agenda. Uh, item A, confirm mayor's appointments to Parks and Rec Advisory Board, Douglas Edwards, Genevieve Johnson, Lynn Copeland, and Caroline Zacker. Uh, item B, confirm mayor's appointment to Economic Development Commission, Angie Presby. C, confirm mayor's appointment to Intercultural Competency and Awareness Committee, Melanie, Melanie Serrano and Melinda Muller Everett. Uh, D, confirm mayor's appointment to the Historic Preservation Commission, Melinda Muller Everett. E, confirm mayor's appointment to Conservation Commission, Alex McPhail. F, confirm mayor's reappointments to Economic Development Commission for Betty Brunswick, Stephen Dupuy, and Robert Quentin. And then G, confirm mayor's reappointment to the Conservation Commission of Natalie ben -Ami. And H, combined massage therapist and establishment license for Karina Myers doing business as C. Rose Wellness, LLC. Is there anyone who would like to remove anything from the agenda? Mr. Mayor. Councilor Johnston. Uh, just item A, please. Item A. Any other? Mr. Mayor. Councilor Gunn. Uh, yes, I'd like uh, item D removed. Item D. Thank you. They will be first up on the action items once we get there. Is there a motion to approve the remainder of the consent agenda? So moved. Councilor Johnston. Is there a second? Second. Councilor Gunn. Discussion? Roll call vote on the consent agenda items minus A and D. Councilor Archer. Councilor Archer, you're muted. Thank you. Aye. Councilor Purdy. Yes. Councilor Gunn. Yes. Councilor Berman. Yes. Councilor McPhail. Yes. Councilor Johnston. Yes. Motion passes 6 0. Thank you. Uh, with that, we are at action item, uh, which is Item nine on the agenda, uh, we will take up item A first, uh, which was consent agenda, and, can, excuse me, consent agenda item A, confirm mayor's appointments to Parks and Rec Advisory Board for Douglas Edwards, Genevieve Johnson, Lynn Copeland, and Caroline Zacker. Is there a motion to approve the, those, can, those uh, appointments? Would you, would you like me to read the background, Mr. Mayor? Councilor Johnston. Uh, the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board has, was established for the purpose of planning a citywide parks and recreation program and to advise and assist the Parks and Recreation Director in initiating and maintaining this program. The board consists of 11 members appointed by the mayor and approved by the council. The responsibility of the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board includes responsibility to promote, enhance, and protect rec recreational opportunities in Saco to maintain and further develop the quality of life and to serve as an advisor to the Parks and Recreation Director and as a forum for the discussion of new and creative programs, including needs and requirements of present and future activities, programs, and projects. Um, be it or City Council confirm the mayor's appointments of Douglas Edwards, Genevieve Johnson, Lynn Copeland, and Caroline Zachariah for a term to begin on March 8th, 2021, and expiring on June 30th, 2024. I move to approve the order. Motion's been made by Councillor Johnston. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Councillor Berman. Discussion? Councillor Johnston. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to, to welcome Doug and, and Genevieve and Caroline aboard. Uh, Director Summers and the chair, Sue Spath, had invited them uh, the last several meetings to, to basically be guests, um, get the lay of the land, so to speak. Um, I thought that they all brought immediate positive impacts to the board. Uh, they're all relatively new to SACO and have a diversity of backgrounds. So welcome board to them. And, and then, of course, thanks to Representative Lynn Copeland for uh, staying on the advisory board. I think all of them are welcoming additions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Johnston. Any, any other comments? Roll call vote on item A. Councilor Archer? Aye. Councilor Purdy? Yes. Councilor Gunn? Yes. Councilor Berman? Yes. Councilor McPhail? Yes. Councilor Johnson? Yes.
Motion passes 6-0. That'll move us to item B, which was uh, consent agenda item D, and that is confirm the mayor's appointment to the Historic Preservation Commission uh, of Melinda Mulla Everett. Councillor Gunn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the Historic Preservation Commission is comprised of five regular members and five associate members. Members serve terms as outlined in sections 230 through 413 of the city's ordinances. Mayor Doyle has recommended the appointment of Melinda Mulla Everett to the Historic Preservation Commission as a regular member to serve a three-year term, uh, March 8, 2021 through March 8, 2024. Be it ordered that the city council confirms the mayor's appointment of Melinda Mala Everett to the Historic Preservation Commission as a regular member for a three-year term from March 8th, 2021 through March 8th, 2024. I move to approve the order. Second. Motion has been made by Councillor Gunn, second by Councillor Johnston. Councillor Gunn. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The uh, reason I pulled this is uh, there was um, two points uh, that were in error when we uh, put this on the agenda. Uh, the first point is that it is not to appoint uh, this new person as a um, regular member. It's actually to appoint them as an associate member. Um, the second point is that it's actually not to commence a full three-year term. It is actually to finish a term uh, that ends in 2022 uh, that was vacated at the end of last year. So. The uh, motion should read, uh, appoint Malaya, uh, Melinda Mala Everett to the Historic Preservation Commission as a, an associate member for a one-year term, which would be from March 8th, 2021 through June 30th of 2022. Councilor Gunn, you want to make that as an amendment? Yes, please. Thank you. Is, is there a second to the amendment? Second. Second by Councilor Archer. Discussion on the amendment? Roll call vote on the amendment only. Councilor Archer? Aye. Councilor Purdy? Yes. Councilor Gunn? Yes. Councilor Berman? Yes. Councilor McPhail? Yes. Councilor Johnston? Yes. Motion passes 6-0. Back to the main motion now as amended. Any discussion? A roll call vote on the main motion as amended. Councilor Archer? Aye. Councilor Purdy? Yes. Councilor Gunn? Yes. Councilor Berman? Yes. Councilor McPhail? Yes. Councilor Johnston? Yes. Motion passes 6-0. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, Mr. we come, Mr. Mayor. Uh, uh, I, I apologize for interrupting, but before I forget, um, uh, not only do I want to congratulate the new member, but uh, can I uh, reach out to uh, staff because I know we have an HPC meeting tomorrow, and um, I'm not sure if anyone is uh, in direct contact with her. But uh, no time like the present to get started. So if someone can inform her, so she has the information that she needs uh, to be being on the meeting. Thank you, Councilor Gunn. City Administrator Canrath will inform the City Clerk, Michelle Hughes, that the Council has taken an affirmative action to appoint uh, Ms. Uh, Melinda Mullet Everett uh, to the Historic Preservation Commission, and the City Clerk will be in touch uh, with, the, with uh, Ms. Everett. Thank you. Uh, with that, we are, at, uh, what is, we are at action item A, which is now action item See a first, re excuse me, a final reading uh, of 146 Main Street contract zone. Councilor Johnston. Thank you. Uh, River House Realty LLC requests that the city consider approving a contract zone that would allow a greater density for proposed residential units in the buildings of, at 146 Main Street. The parcel is about uh, 6,969 square feet in area, it was acquired by the current owner in February 2018. John Miley, manager of the property, has submitted a request for contract zone review. The goal of converting existing office space on the second and third floors to 12 residential units. Given the size of the parcel and the required minimum lot area for a dwelling unit, 1,500 square feet in the B3 zone, no more than four residential units would be possible. Mr. Miley's request is that the minimum lot area for a dwelling unit be reduced to 560 square feet, 
which would allow 12 units to be created. This item was reviewed by the planning board at its January 5th meeting. The board arrived at a positive finding on each of the four standards found in section 230-1405F and voted to forward a positive recommendation to the council. Uh, motion by second, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, I move to approve the second and final reading and adopt the findings in the contract zone document entitled Contract Zone Agreement Buying Between Riverhouse Realty LLC and the City of Saco, dated January 5th, 2021. The property identified as tax map 38, lot four, as authorized by section 1405, the zoning ordinance pursuant to 30 AMRSA section 43528. Motion has been made by Councilor Johnston. Is there a second? Second. Second. Second by Council of Berman. Discussion. Councilor Johnston. Thank you. Uh, I just, again, I, I think I said this several weeks ago, um, but there were some questions last week during the public hearing. So I just would address those. Uh, the, the building that we're speaking of is, is known as the Sweetser Block. This particular section of the building happens to be the the long portion uh, closest to the river. Um, uh, I think generally speaking, if, if you believe in, in land use and land regulation as, or zoning as, as I do, uh, contract zones really should be a, a high bar uh, for them to be agreed upon. In this particular case, we're talking about a real minor um, request that without really would leave a, a lot of unutilized space, you know, further unutilized. Um, so, I mean, this, this particular request is, is definitely consistent with the comprehensive plan. Um, and I think it would be a benefit to the downtown. It, it passes all other requirements, including parking, which is usually something that I get hung up on. Um, so, you know, as, as I said, weeks ago, when we had undertaken the, the rezoning process, the, the hope was really to not have the issue we have today, which is you know trying to achieve greater density, but our, our current ordinance doesn't really allow for it. Um, you know, towards I guess I'd call it like you know the eleventh hour, we we had arrived at a, a conclusion of NA or not applicable as far as the density for the downtown and. Um, our attorney told us, you know, that you couldn't have not applicable. So given that it was so late in the stage, um, I, I had, I just fell back on what the average was for the two zones, the B3 and the MU uh, one and um, arrived at the 1500. So long story short, I, I hope going forward that we'll readdress this in a subsequent amendment and arrive at a minimum lot area per dwelling unit. That's, you know, much more appropriate for what we're trying to do downtown. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Any other discussion on this item? Councillor Archer? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to present, I, I think that this is a good example of how the city should look at infill. Um, it, it allows for increased density with limited dis, uh, disruptions to the area. Again, they're not really changing the blueprint of this brick building that's been around for hundreds of years. Um, so again, I just wanted to say that I, when I look at infill, I think this is a great example of how we should be looking uh, for further development of the, these types of buildings in that type of area. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Archer. Any further discussion? Roll call vote, Councilor Archer. Aye. Councilor Purdy. Yes. Councilor Gunn. Yes. Councilor Berman? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Councilor McPhail? Yes. Councilor McPhail? Did that come? Th yes. Thank you. Councilor Johnston? Yes. Thank you. Uh, bear with us all, folks. It looks like we're having a little bit of technical difficulties here, uh, but we'll We'll stay the course and we'll get through it. Uh, with that, uh, we are at action item uh, B, which now becomes action item D, a final reading on chapter 81, Camp Ellis Parcels, Council of Berman. Yes, thank you. 
Uh, the city has received requests from three Camp Ellis property owners to consider the sale of three small city-owned parcels that abut parcels owned by the three individuals. In two of the cases, a conveyance of the small city-owned parcel would allow the two individuals to realize a somewhat larger property while still being non-conforming due to not meeting minimum lot size. The third would result in two non-conforming parcels being combined to result in a conforming lot in terms of lot area. This item was reviewed by the planning board at its January 5th meeting. The board forwards unanimous recommendation that the city retain each of the three lots and that maintenance and public access are optimized if the lot remains in the public realm. Uh, so I'd like to read, be it ordered that the city council hereby authorizes the city administrator to initiate the sale of the properties identified as tax map one, lots 31, 36, and 42. Motion's been made by Councilor Berman. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilor Purdy. Discussion? Councilor Berman? Yeah, I think this will be maybe the third time I've said this, uh, but two important aspects of this for me are, are that the city uh, put into place during the sale easements to allow access for, for uh, any erosion mitigation or any necessary work down there. And uh, we have in our packet information that that's entirely possible. So I, I think some of the concerns uh, about the city having access for that purpose uh, can easily be met. Uh, I've also heard concerns about uh, beach access uh, for the public. I don't think any of these plots are commonly used for beach access and uh, uh, people intending to buy the properties uh, don't intend to block anyone's use or transit through the property. Uh, so I'm perfectly comfortable that the city can sell these properties and address the concerns that we've heard uh, from neighbors. It brings these onto the tax roll uh, and off of the city. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna support this motion. Thank you, Councillor Berman. Councillor Johnston. Thank you. Um, as I said several weeks ago, I, I, you know, I appreciate all the feedback, the, you know, those in favor or the abutters, I guess, that are in favor of, of purchasing the property and, and those against the sale or, or not in favor. Um, but I, I still, as I sit here today, I, I think this is a premature action. Um, you know, it's cart before the horse. Uh, and I recognize that we can get certain things uh, into the deeds. And I certainly would encourage that if we are to, to sell this. Uh, but I, I still have, have questions and concerns that all surround around the Army Corps. Um, you know, we seem to be as, as close as we ever have in the history of this um, issue. And I'm concerned that, you know, we, we may get to that PPA and they're looking for us to acquire additional land and here we are having sold it off. So one of the things I would suggest again, if council is going to move ahead with this is that we look to put some kind of restriction on this land that would allow us to buy back the land that we are selling at our purchase price or at the, the purchaser's price. Um, if we find in the future that we you know, need additional land based on you know, this Army Corps project. Um, but again, I, I, I think we're, we're kind of opening up our, ourselves for um, further or greater issues. I mean, we have several other lots down there that city owns. Are we going to sell those? I mean, one of them happens to be the beach itself. It used to be a, a house back in there till the early 1990s when I was a kid. I remember washing it, it washing away. Um, I mean, if you really take a look at all the lots down there and you see how many of the city owns, you know, Again, I think you're opening ourselves up to saying, hey, I want to buy that. And then we've set a precedent here with this. Um, and and as, as Jeff Brochu pointed out, the, the comp plan in 2018, we actually added a chapter uh, related to shoreland issues. And it's pretty specific as to trying to maintain that access because we, we don't know what's going to happen going forward. So I mean, that's my feeling on it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Johnston.
Any other comments? Councilor Johnston. If no other counselor has any comments, I would just ask uh, the administrator, what's the plan going forward if this motion prevails? Will this come back? Um, chapter 81 is pretty clear as far as how we go about selling properties. And the way I read it, there's, there's nothing in there that's just an outright agreement or, or a sale. It's either we go out for a bid, we request bids or proposals. Uh, so, you know, I guess that would be, if, if this is, you know, voted in favor of, are you just going to sign something or is this coming back to council um, for us to vote it on again? Uh, Councilor, I would want to follow the chapter 81 process uh, by the letter of what it reads. So I would, I guess, tomorrow consult with our uh, city solicitor and planning uh, staff to determine what the appropriate next step would be. But obviously we want to follow chapter 81 um, as written. But I don't recall an instance, at least since I've been here, where this has happened. So I would need to uh, myself just brush up on exactly what the procedure is. Thank you. Well. Again, it, it, it's clear that council decides how we sell it. So I don't know if that's something we need to decide now or if that's something, you know, yourself and the rest of city staff will go and bring us some ideas as to how to go about doing this. In the past, when I've participated in it, we did um, a sealed bid process um, where everybody, anybody really in the city of Stockholm could have, could have uh, been a purchaser as with what the way this has been presented so far is it's just the abutters that are being afforded this opportunity, which as I've said previously, I think it's an unfair process. Thank you, Councilor Johnson. Any other comments? Councilor Archer. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And with this, I've actually talked with the owner too, uh, and thank you for um, that perspective. I've been going 50-50 on this one because I see benefits and I see uh, barriers to both sides of them. And most recently, I think a lot of the barriers are what's popping up in my mind. Um, and I want to bring up, uh, it was probably about a month ago, we're talking about the main turnpike authority. And they sold, there's a new house, uh, it's I think it's one North Street or um, out, out this way. It's right there where the turnpike entrance is going to be. And in uh, discussions with Maine Turnpike Authority, they, in, in the end, they wish they didn't sell the land. It's creating all these headaches because they sold the land for about 20000 And now they're trying to build a park and ride and exit right where that house is. Um, this uh, unfortunately, this happened to came at the same time as this, so these concerns are fresh in my mind. Um, and again, it's not that I—it's not about the owner or that. It's again that the city only has so much land, and land is a finite resource. Um, I definitely see the owner's intent, the abutter's intent, and in what they're doing, and I also, I also honestly understand their vision. It's just I have very s s concerns again uh, with Councillor Johnson bringing up. I do not want to throw a wrench into the Army Corps of Engineers. And this could be or not be. Let me just say it's, it's, it's unknown at this time. But I'd hate for this to be a wrench down the road that we have to then figure out again. Um, with that said, when we vote on a motion as written, we're pretty much saying this is how it's going to go. And I do have concerns of not having in the language of how the city is going to retain ownership uh, post sale, if they ever do first of right refusal uh, issues like that, or how we're going to have access. And it's not written in the motion. And unfortunately, I don't have an amendment at this time, a good written amendment. Um, so uh, minus a good written amendment, I'm going to vote this down. However, if I can protect the city's interest in the long run, I'd be for it. Um, but as written, I'm, I'm not on board. Thank you, Council Archer. Any other comments?
Hearing no other comments, a roll call vote. Council Archer. No. Councilor Purdy. Yes. Councilor Gunn. No. Councilor Berman. Yes. Councilor McPhail. With the uncertainties of the Army Corps going forward, um, I need to go no. Councilor Johnson. No. Motion fails 2-4. Moving on to item C. What was item C? Now item E. That is a public hearing that was tabled from March 1st, 2021. A special entertainment permit for Riverwind events. Council Archer. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Beth Austin, doing business as RW Events LLC 121 Loudon Road, has applied for a new special entertainment permit. The permit will be concurrent with the establishment's liquor license. The applicant has paid all applicable permit and fees, and the clerk has properly advised the public hearing in accordance with the Saco City Code, Chapter 93, Entertainment, Subsection 93, Attack 2. I I move to close the public hearing and be it ordered that the city council grant the new application submitted by Beth Austin DBA RW events LLC for a special entertainment permit for private events only as per the current contract zone agreement and said permit to be concurrent with the establishment's liquor license. I move to approve the order. Second. Council Archer, I, I, uh, hold on. I, yeah. I think we have to take it off the table. Uh, that's correct. Because it was tabled. That's what I stumbled on, but I figured yeah. I'd just continue reading it. If you can make the motion to untable. Uh, I, uh, yes, uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. I make a motion to untable the uh, application for a special in entertainment permit for RW Events LLC. Thank you very much. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Roll call vote on untabling. Councilor Archer? Aye. Councilor Purdy? Yes. Councilor Gunn? Yes. Councilor Berman? Yes. Councilor McPhail? Yes. Councilor Johnston? Yes. Motion passes 6 0 to on table. Councilor Archer, can you repeat the, the motion? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That's what was actually why I was stumbling on words, was my brain was processing what I was reading and it wasn't connecting. <laughs> Um, I move to close the public hearing and be it ordered that the City Council grant the new application submitted by Beth Austin, doing business as RW Events LLC for a special entertainment permit for private events only as the current contract zone agreement and said permit to be concurrent with the establishment's liquor license. I move to approve the order. Motion's second. been made by Councilor Archer, second by Councilor McPhail. Uh, discussion? Councilor Johnson. Thank you. Um, I didn't see many changes in our packet, so I'm, I guess I'm asking staff, whoever that may be, all of those involved, um, where we are as of today. And I guess specifically for, for myself, um, did Mr. or Attorney Murphy's opinion change at all? Because he seemed to have several lengthy opinions, but. Um, so that's, that's what I'm asking. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Johnston. Uh, can we promote uh, Code Enforcement Officer Toomey? Hello, this is David Toomey, Code Enforcement Director. Um, basically, River Winds um, has got a CO, so that issue has gone by. Um, we're all set with all other issues. I have talked to this city attorney and this department believes that this permit shall be issued. Thank you, Director Toomey. You, there, please stay with us as there may be some more questions. Okay. Council Archer. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to bring up that how this was presented at our last meeting was was I wish we had more information because, again, this council could have made a decision based on bad information, which would have substantially 
uh, hurt one of our local businesses. I'm glad that this was tabled uh, because it allowed us to clear up a lot of information because once reviewed, we realized we had everything that we needed. Um, I don't want to see this happen again to one of our businesses. Again, we need to get the most accurate information. The council is what I'm saying before some of these decisions are made. So I'm so glad that the council had the foresight to say, hey, we don't know if we have all the information. We should slow it down. We should look at it. But again, this could have gone the other way where we canceled someone's ability to make a profit in this city in this time uh, because we had... I don't want to call it bad information, but not all the information. So I would like to make sure that this doesn't happen again and that we continue to table if we do get these EBGBs. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Archer. Councilor Johnston. Thank you. Uh, it was a little unclear to me through all the information where we stood with, with the plumbing issue or, or bathrooms. Um, so if, if Director Toomey could comment on that, that'd be appreciated. Thank you, Councilor um, Johnston, Director Toomey. Hi, um, basically they have a bathroom trailer, which is fine. It's the state who has an issue, but where they're running the number of people, they're good. They will work with the state in the future to add permanent bathrooms if they change what they have. But what they have on the agenda for now, those bathrooms will work. So there's no problem with the existing bathrooms unless they change their business plan. Thank you, Director Toomey. Councilor Johnston. Thank you. Um, no, he answered my questions. Um, I'm all set with that. I just, I think going forward, um, perhaps we should relook at this chapter of the code because when you look at state law, it has more provisions that we could add that would kind of uh, prevent any of this in the future because we could make it again uh, clear where in this particular case, perhaps it's not because again, going back to 17, uh, when I was on council, I, I was under the understanding, I had the understanding that we were going to have permanent bathrooms out there, um, but that's a whole other topic. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Johnston. Councillor Berman. Yeah, I think in regards to plumbing, there was some question about, about sprinklers in the barn too. Has, has that been resolved? Director Toomey. They actually put a two hour firewall between the barn and the house, which makes the requirement of a sprinkler system not required because it, it separates them as two separate buildings and the barn isn't big enough that requires it on itself. So they're all set with not needing sprinklers. Thank you. Thank you, Director Toomey. Thank you, Councilor Berman. Director Toomey, would it be possible uh, as uh, not for tonight's hearing, but as the Riverwind Farms is going through the planning process to update their contract zone uh, or broaden their use of their contract zone. Uh, would it be possible to put some of these concerns into that contract zone uh, through that process? Yes. Thank you. Uh, any further questions? Hearing no further questions and seeing no counselor seeking recognition, Roll call vote. Councilor Arch? Aye. Councilor Purdy? Yes. Councilor Gunn? Yes. Councilor Berman? Yes. Councilor McPhail? Yes. Councilor Johnston? Yes. Motion passes 6 0. Thank you very much. Uh, we are at item, uh, action item D, which is now item F. And that is a public hearing zoning amendment to add master plan development as a permitted use in the Portland Road District. Uh, this was assigned to Councillor Johnston uh, and I believe Councillor McPhail read it last time. Uh, Councillor McPhail, do you want to read or Councillor Johnston, let me defer to you first. Would you like to read this or would you like to defer to Councillor McPhail? I'm all about consistency. So we'll, we'll stick with uh, Councillor McPhail. Thank you Thank very you. much. Councillor McPhail. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The amendment for adding master plan development as a permitted use in the Portland Road District was brought forth as part of the zoning ordinance approval process at the January 11th, 2021 council meeting. Upon consultation with legal counsel, it was advised that the city council refer the amendments back to the planning board for review public hearing and report to the city council based upon subsection 230-1401B of the zoning ordinance. 
The planning board held the public hearing on this amendment on February 2nd, 2021. After discussion, the board voted 7-0 in support of its December 1st, 2020 recommendation that master plan development be removed from the Portland Road Zoning District and that the board's goal will be to refine the MPD standards for incorporating into the ordinance in the near future. I move to open the public hearing. Council McPhail has made a motion to open the public hearing. Is there a second? Second. Second by Council Purdy. Discussion on opening the public hearing. A roll call vote on opening the public hearing. Council Archer. Aye. Councilor Purdy. Yes. Councilor Gunn. Yes. Councilor Berman. Yes. Councilor McPhail. Yes. Councilor Johnston. Yes. Motion passes 6 0 to open the public hearing at 7 37 p.m. If there's anyone who would like to speak to the council during the public hearing, please use the raise hand feature of the Zoom platform or star nine from a phone. Uh, at this point, we have uh, one hand raised, and that is Zoom identifier Kevin Sutherland. Kevin, you've been allowed to unmute. Please go ahead and uh, do so. State your name and address for the record and preside, uh, present your comments to the city council. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Kevin Sutherland, 15 North Street. I had offered to provide additional context to this item and the next one, which I'll save that for then. Uh, for the, the goals of the Portland Road, um, there was a lot of conversation around nodes, concept of nodes. This piece really was a solution to, to allow for uh, one developer to take a large lot and actually think about it as a mixed use lot. So multiple different iterations or ideas or concepts could be developed in one fall swoop. Uh, I, I support the idea of this to be done in our city. Um, obviously the planning board has said they wanna modify it. Um, they're welcome to, but I think that the best solution for the council at this time is to try to move this forward um, with, with those modifications for the Portland Road. Uh, again, it's about density where utilities exist. Uh, Portland Road is Route 1, which takes us between Biddeford and Saco and downtown Portland. It's where the transportation system is. It's where now sewer exists along that road. So this is where our, our density should occur, not on the other side of, of 95. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. If there's anybody else who would like to speak during the public comment, please use the raise hand feature of the Zoom platform and you'll be unmuted to deliver your comments to council. Up next, we have Zoom identifier, Jeff Broch. Jeff, you've been allowed to unmute. Please go ahead and do so. State your name and address for the record and present your comments to the council. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My name is Jeff Brochu. I reside at 257 Buxton Road. Um, I've also been a plan member of the planning board through this process, but I'd like to speak to you um, personally on my behalf. Um, you know, having observed this process, I think that the overall consensus is that master plan development, it's a very critical tool that we need to have available in our town for a lot of the reasons that you've heard tonight, our ability to offset um, our tax base, our ability to control density, in areas where we strategically want to. Um, all in all, it's, it's a general tool, a very good tool. Um, but I think what, what we find as we really navigate through the process is that the master plan development tool has been sitting on the shelf since 2013. It's been there, it hasn't been utilized, it hasn't been tested. Oh, well, actually, I take that back. It, it has just recently been tested. It's like the first time we went to use it. And we discovered in that process that there are a lot of pieces that don't work. So in basic analogy, like any other tool that we might have around our home or in our kitchen, you know, something that helps us, you know, remove snow or, you know, peel and core apples in the kitchen, 
If you find a tool in your kitchen that you know could cause a serious laceration or dismemberment, most reasonable people would want to fix that tool before they hand it to their children or grandchildren. And I think that recent um, application of exercising this tool for the first time really pointed that out. It pointed out that there are several dangerous components to it that need to be repaired. They need to be repaired for the future of our community. And I think that's what the, the consensus of the planning board and the ZOR committee was really getting at. Hey, we know that this is a great, great opportunity, but we need to repair these things before we allow it to be implemented and let our loved ones use it, if you will. So um, I would just respectfully ask that you, you, you realize that that is the ultimate mission. We want to allow the city to have this tool, but we've identified that there are, are really some dangerous portions to it. Um, and dangerous in multiple levels. I mean, once the development's done, we, we can't control it. Um, but it also, I think it's not really fair to applicants. The, the way the, the standards are worded and we try to apply them, it's very difficult um, to know what needs to be done when. And that I think is really what the, the planning department is, is asking for, or maybe not the department, but the board was referencing. And, um, I would just ask that, you know, recognize it is a, a very viable opportunity um, and that we recognize it. We just want to try to repair it before we allow somebody else to try to give it a run through so that, you know, prospective developers don't end up with a disappointing flavor of the city of Saco saying that they had this opportunity and they treated us unfairly or, or inappropriately. So I would just ask that, you know, you give us that opportunity um, or maybe reform the ZOR committee to relook at this before we implement it in the Portland Road District. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. I have no more hands raised uh, for public during the public hearing. Council Archer. I'm sorry, Councilor McPhail. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move to close the public hearing and to schedule the second and final reading of zoning ordinance amendment to add master plan development as a permitted use in the Portland Road District for March 22nd, 2021. Motion's been made by Councilor McPhail. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilor Purdy to close the public hearing and set final reading for March 22nd, 2021. Any discussion? It's Council Archer. Uh, yes, I just wanted to um, uh, just kind of build off what uh, our citizen, Mr. Brochu just stated. Uh, when this, a couple of weeks ago, I brought up the idea of that we need to learn more of what this is. The city, the city does, the council does, our citizens do. And I did bring up the idea of a moratorium so that we can learn more about, as Mr. Brochu said, the tools. If you don't know how to use the tool correctly, you can get into yourself some danger. So again, I will bring that back up that I believe this should be a moratorium. Um, I, don't, I don't know where I stand, but if we vote this for or down, we can't bring it up again for a year. A moratorium would allow us to learn this tool better, to have it in our arsenal to bet for better economic development. So again, we, this will come back to us at our next meeting, um, but I definitely think this is something that we should have a discussion on. Again, from a perspective of not delaying it, but to have everyone learn exactly what this is and how to best use it in the interest of the city. Thank you. Thank you, Council Archer. Any further discussion? Roll call vote. Councilor Archer? Aye. Councilor Purdy? Yes. Councilor Gunn? Yes. Councilor Berman? Yes. Councilor McPhail? Yes. Councilor Johnston? Yes. Motion passes 6 0. Yeah. That brings us to what was action item E, which is action item. G, and that is a public hearing zoning map amendment for the parcels on Flag Pond Road, previously zoned low density residential to be rezoned industrial. Uh, 
Councilor Johnson, that was uh, assigned to you. Do you want to defer as we've done uh, in the previous cases to Councilor McPhail? Please. Thank you. Councilor McPhail. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Landowners Rand and Susan Clark have requested a zoning map amendment for portions of two parcels on Flag Pond Road. Roughly 1.5 acres of the parcel are zoned R-1A currently. They would become low density residential upon adoption of the new zoning map and are requested to be rezoned to industrial. This amendment was brought forth as part of the zoning ordinance review process at the January 11th, 2021 council meeting. Upon further consultation with legal counsel, it was advised that the city council refer the amendments back to the planning board for review, public hearing and report to the city council based upon section 230-1401B of the SOCO zoning ordinance. The planning board held the public hearing on this amendment on February 2nd, 2021. At that meeting, the board voted 5-1 to forward a negative recommendation for the proposed rezoning. I move to open the public hearing. Motion's been made by Councilor McPhail to open the public hearing. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilor Purdy. Discussion on open the public hearing. A roll call vote on opening the public hearing. Councilor Archer? Aye. Councilor Purdy? Yes. Councilor Gunn? Yes. Councilor Berman? Yes. Councilor McPhail? Yes. Councilor Johnson. Yes. Motion passes 6 0 to open the public hearing at 7 47 p.m. Public hearing is now open. Uh, if there's members of the public who would like to address the council, please use the raise hand feature or star nine, and you'll be unmuted to speak to the council. First up, we have Zoom identifier Kevin Sutherland. Kevin, you've been allowed to. Uh, on mute, please go ahead and do so. State your name and address for the record and present your comments to the City Council. Zoom identifier, Kevin Sutherland, 15 North Street. Um, I wanted to just uh, uh, su support what uh, Councillor Johnson said two weeks ago. There are challenges with getting to this site for sure. Um, the hope was to do it off a of Wiley Road, um, but again, that ca crosses the DeFoss's property and there'd have to be uh, agreements with her, although I think her hopeful, her goal would be to make that all private roads. So there will be challenges regardless of what the council decides tonight in terms of whether or not this, they allow for it to be an industrial zone. Um, but I think changing it to industrial is an extension of what's, what it's near, um, but not also it's near the low residential. Ultimately it would be beneficial for this whole, that whole stretch of the city to eventually uh, become denser uh, does that include industrial? That's for you to decide. Um, I, I I still think the challenge will be getting it through uh, sight line issues on Flag Pond Road and other traffic constraint challenges that they'd have to face with any type of project that went in there. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, up next, we have Zoom identifier Inga Brown. Inga, you've been allowed to unmute. Please go ahead and do so. State your name and address for the record and present your comments to the City Council. Yes, hi, good evening. Uh, Inga Brown, uh, 161 Simpson Road. Um, I apologize. I'm going to throw a left field uh, question at you, Mayor Doyle. I'm looking at the agenda um, for this evening. And item C, the special entertainment permit for Riverwinds Farm was listed as a public hearing, as was item D, as was item E. Uh, was the public going to, had, should the public have been allowed to speak during item C? Uh, Inga, the, the item C was a tabled motion from a previous uh, previous meeting where we held the uh, where we already held the public hearing on that item. Correct. Uh, it was tabled, it was untabled, uh, and moved forward. Would it be helpful in the future, the way that it's listed on the agenda, if one looks at item C, it does look identical to the other public hearings listed 
it says public hearing in um, parentheses. That is confusing. Thank you. I will notify city administration uh, that handles the writing of these documents uh, and, and note that confusion. I was prepared to speak this evening on item C, so my regrets that I was not able to do that. You remember, uh, Ms. Brown, you can always speak during public comment uh, at, and that it was uh, item six on the agenda. Anyone can speak during public comment. You mean at the beginning of the meeting? Correct. Right. But I was looking at it listed as a public hearing, the way that it's listed. So that is uh, very confusing to the public. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, up next, we have Zoom identifier Victoria. Victoria, you've been allowed to unmute. Please go ahead and do so. State your name and address for the record and present your comments to council. Hi, my name is Victoria Frankel, owner at 126 Flag Pond Road. Thank you to the council for the opportunity to speak twice tonight. I apologize. I entered my comment a little bit prematurely there at the beginning of the meeting. But I am against the proposed zoning change to industrial on Flag Pond Road. Our community is close-knit. There's housing developments being built on the other side of the overpass. I am confident that the new housing will um, add to the community. I don't see how an industrial zone in the middle of a rural farm-like neighborhood is going to, to add to that community at all. We're already subject to light, noise, and air pollution from Route 1, from I-95, as well as the heavy commuter traffic on Flag Pond Road itself. Um, in addition to the integrity of the neighborhood, I'm also concerned about the fallback this project might have on the environment, namely the brook, um, potential soil erosion um, could be devastating to Scarborough Marsh. Um, and I, I, I'm hoping that throughout this process, I know there's already a lot of logging going on, that there can be um, hopefully a little bit more transparency for those of us who are really concerned about the environment um, in our backyard. Um, I'm also concerned about potential groundwater pollution. I mean, even if this industri industry, if, I mean, if it's just a parking lot, for instance, um, doesn't need to be a building, there will be runoff. And I know that a lot of my neighbors don't have wells, but I have a well. Um, and I really would um, like to know what Mr. Clark is proposing to prevent industrial um, runoff. And I also would encourage the uh, city to um, ask that Mr. Clark is responsible for sustainability and environmental stewardship. Those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Any other members of the public that would like to speak during the public hearing on zoning map amendment for the parcels on Flag Pond Road, previously zoned uh, low density residential to be rezoned industrial. We have Zoom identifier Cassandra Collin. Cassandra, you've been allowed to unmute. Please go ahead and do so. State your name and address for the record and present your comments to the city council. Thank you so much. I'm Cassandra Collin at 121 Flag Pond Road. And also um, I apologize for giving the abundance of information at the opening hearing. Um, this is my first time speaking at the city council meeting. So I believe that my information probably would have been better suited at this moment. Um, so please take into consideration what I said previously. Also, I am considering or concerned with the change, the considerable change on the flag pond road west of Mr. Clark's, Clark's proposed change. And um, he did provide us with a letter again yesterday on March 7th that I would like to reference. Um, I'd like to reference number three on his letter, which uh, question says, has any development already been conducted or approved at this parcel? 
and he refers to um, nothing has even been proposed yet. No development has been planned or approved yet. However, there will be many steps in the process to getting approvals, including a site plan review by the SACO planning board with the consideration of what we can locate there at its impact. So this I feel is contraindicative of the meeting early February on the 22nd of the planning board, which denied Mr. Clark's approval of this um, change in parcel. So I'm concerned as to why this is still being considered. Also, I'd like to um, draw attention to number eight, which Mr. Clark said, what about screens and sound barriers? There is one row of mature trees between 148 Flag Pond Road and the nearest neighborhood. Should the proposed access be granted, a driveway access is placed there. We have agreed to put an additional row rows of evergreen trees to screen site and buffer the sound. However, Mr. Clark has already moved forward with the clearing of that lot. So I'm concerned that if he had not ever cleared the lot, we wouldn't actually have a sound barrier issue. So why um, would he have cleared it in the first place? Mr. Clark also personally addressed a lot of my neighbors um, in terms of walking the property with him. I'd like to have the opportunity to visit the land and the considerations before the public city council meeting. And I, again, reiterate the inconclusiveness of the information and the timing of information provided to me as well as my neighbors. And that is all, thank you. Thank you, Cassandra. Uh, up next, we have Zoom identifier Rand Clark. Rand, you've been uh, allowed to unmute. Please go ahead and do so. State your name and address for the record and present your comments to council. Sure. I just want to request, name and oh, sorry, Rand Clark, address 41 River Ridge Drive, Dayton, Maine. Just wanted to confirm that the letters, I believe there's at least eight letters in support of this uh, that they will be read this evening during the public hearing and entered into the public record, please. Rand, those, uh, those items that were delivered to the city will be incorporated into the uh, document that goes online, uh, but they will be not read into the record unless they were specifically asked to be read into the record uh, by those folks submitting them to the city administrator in accordance with the rules uh, of the council uh, when we first entered the pandemic. Okay. 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 Okay, then let me just say that Susan and I have made ourselves completely transparent. So far, we've only received one phone call. Um, we have taken the initiative to meet with people and we really are genuine and sincere to say that we'd be happy to schedule one-on-ones or whatever you would like at the site. We have two scheduled currently, two different ones. Um, and I think for those that we've had an opportunity to meet with, and I know obviously it's an emotional issue, but after folks have spoken with us and really come to understand, they seem to feel much more comfortable with the idea of this. <clears throat> in fact, we believe that the impact to traffic and things like that will be less than the development that's going on currently for 14 homes on the corner of Jenkins and Flag Pond Road. I quote, with 12 to 25 to 40 employees, even if a few commercial buildings are eventually developed, the projected number of daily vehicle trips is liable to result in negligible impact on existing roads and intersections. That was from the staff of the planning department. In terms of what's happened currently, the land has simply been logged. Selective cutting and then some more open cutting where we would propose that some development would go on. Um, we have 
offered to donate land on both sides of Cascade Brook as a park to the city. There is currently an easement for a walking trail as well. Uh, we have never posted our land and have made it available to anybody who would like to walk there, walk their dog, uh, anything like that. It's our hopes that that trail would extend the Sylvan Trail across the street. The area is treed. We intend to leave it treed. And all of those things, the wetlands, the vernal pools, and the area along the brook will be completely protected. We will submit to all of the requirements. And I'll just end by saying that in terms of line of sight, the requirement is 390 feet. We are able to give an access that would be 775 feet, almost double of what's required. So we believe that we have been good citizens of the community and that neighborhood more than 12 years. And we would like to continue to contribute in a positive way to that neighborhood and to the city of Saco. And we're available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Rand. <clears throat> Up next, we have Zoom identifier, Paul Hersey. Paul, you've been allowed to unmute. Please go ahead and do so. State your name and address for the record and present your comments to the council. Yes, my name is uh, Paul. <clears throat> Excuse me, Paul Hersey, 117 Flag Pond Road. Um, I discussed this with Mr. Clark yesterday when he visited my home at 117 Flag Pond Road about the low water pressure on Flag Pond Road. Um, I am on public water. And earlier this evening, I believe the gentleman uh, stated his address was 40 Flag Pond Road. Uh, also mentioned about the low water pressure on this road. Uh, first thing in the morning, uh, very, very low, low water pressure. So my concern, and I shared this with Mr. Clark yesterday, is whatever goes in for uh, a business, well, first, if this, if this is a zone change, and, and the council does approve of it, then whatever goes in there is going to need water. So is this going to be addressed? And when, it's, when is it going to be addressed? Because if you start adding more demand on water from the water line on Flag Pond Road, it's going to affect uh, other residents on the road. Uh, Victoria says uh, she is lucky enough to still have a drilled well. I don't know how many other residents on Flag Pond Road still have their well, but uh, I think most of us, at least on the west end of Flag Pond Road before the turnpike, have uh, public water. And it is a concern with uh, uh, low water pressure certain times of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I don't see any other hands raised for pop up. Up next, we have Zoom identifier Greg Shinberg. Greg, you've been allowed to unmute. Please go ahead and do so. State your name and address for the record and present your comments to the City Council. Good evening, uh, Mayor and members of the Council and members <laughs> of the community. My name is Greg Shinberg. I am a consultant for Rand and Susan Clark, and my office is at 181 State Street in Portland. I wanted to try to answer some of the questions and concerns, very legitimate ones raised uh, by the neighbors on Flag Pond and a few of them uh, ran briefly mentioned groundwater runoff. Uh, that certainly would need to be addressed at a planning board meeting. 
uh, as is typical of any planning board meeting. You need to be able to handle any kind of runoff. And if there's sensitive areas like the Cascade Brook, there certainly are requirements that you have to be well back of the brook and you have to mitigate any problems that would come from your building, whether it's impervious surfaces, building roofs, et cetera. In regards to the water pressure out there, uh, any project that would need to be approved by a planning board would also need typically things like the ability to serve letters, not just water, but uh, electricity, et cetera. Out on these lots, which could handle, like I believe has been mentioned earlier, five to seven buildings possibly, given the 80,000 square foot zone out there on 12 acres, you're about five to seven buildings because of the issues we just discussed. You could have private wells, or you could have a plan to boost the water pressure, but there are ways to deal with this. And this would be a planning board uh, site plan review issue that should be addressed. Um, certainly the environmental issues are key over on the Cascade Brook area. You have a, a wide area, probably two to 400 feet either side of Cascade Brook that is undevelopable. And behind uh, 148 Flag Pond, there's many areas of the industrial land that go all the way down Flag Pond behind some of the other folks, including I believe these folks that have spoken tonight. And there's a lot of wet land there. So it's really not developable land, even though it's a uh, zoned industrial. Um, this is probably prob one of the most important points is that when you look at the new proposed zoning map for the city, I'm going to guess that 95% of the land north of the I-95 I corridor is either the PR zone or the industrial zone. And it's been like that for a long time. And I certainly understand where folks on Flag Pond are concerned about development around them. I think it's fair to say that there has been the potential for development around them for a long time, coming in from the Portland Road to the north of them, to the south of them, there's a tremendous amount of developable land. And the amount of current R1A, which is gonna be the LDR zone property is pretty minimal. Uh, and if I'd like to finish and I'll try to keep it very brief, I think it's important to note that with the letters that came in about the Clarks were many letters that talked about their integrity. They've been property owners in the uh, community for a long time. Uh, I'm a consultant that have worked in the greater Portland area for a long, long time. And I've rarely met owners that really listen. They have talked to city officials, they've talked to neighbors, They've talked to consultants like me, traffic engineers, uh, environmental engineers. They've been really careful about approaching this and they've listened very, very well to the whole process. It's something that should be considered. They're good citizens of the city. They're trying to do the right thing. This property is underused and landlocked and the potential for a small amount of industrial land, I've heard it called a park, this won't be an industrial park, nothing like the Saco Industrial Park or the Millbrook Park. It's a very small uh, change to that land. It's right next to the turnpike. There's already access for the turnpike on both sides that they have to Flag Pond. And this just seems to be a sensible way to utilize some very underutilized property with a minimal impact uh, on the neighbors. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Uh, up next, we have Cassandra Collin. Cassandra, you've been allowed to unmute. Please go ahead and do so. State your name and address for the record and present your comments to the city council. Thank you so much, uh, Cassandra Collin, 121 Flag Pond Road in Saco. Um, I would just like to reiterate what Mr. Schoenberg said or go off of what he said. Um, the multiple letters that we received as um, residents of 121 Flag Pond Road, we received two of them. Also, um, I would just like to go off of basically his comp comments about the planning board deciding what's going to happen but early in February when the when this information was pres presented to the planning board the planning board had denied this um, 
change in the parcel on 121 Flag Pond Road. So I'm con I'm concerned about why this is still being addressed or how they think that the planning board is going to necessarily change what we're thinking. Um, and I also just am concerned with ultimately what's going to go into this. I know that they say that it's not going to be like an industrial park road, but we're not really guaranteed if we necessarily agree with this parcel change, what the outcomes are going to be. So it just seems very vague in terms of the information that we're being presented with. And there isn't really a lot of conclusive information. So again, I'd like to reiterate the fact that I think that this should just be something that is presented back to the planning board or the city council and is just investigated further. And that the residents of one of Flag Ponds Road are presented with information that's more conclusive and is actually, in fact, what's necessarily going to be happening with our neighborhood around us. Thank you. I think Thank that's all that I have to say. <laughs> Thank you, Cassandra. Last call for public comment. Up next is Zoom identifier, Victoria. Actually, we're going to move to somebody who hasn't spoken yet in accordance with the Roberts rules, and that is a Zoom identifier, Don Jure. Don, you've been allowed to unmute. Please go ahead and do so. State your name and address for the record and present your comments to the city council. Good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. Uh, Don Gerard, member of the Pointing Board, residing at 58 Lafayette Street in Saco. Um, just for the sake of clarity, because folks may misunderstand what the process is involving the Pointing Board, and I just want to make that clear. As is typical with any ordinance change or any, or any amendment to the ordinance, uh, this change to to the zoning on the Flag Pond Road came to us as a zoning ordinance amendment. And for those folks who, who maybe are a little bit confused about the process, the way that works is an ordinance amendment comes before the planning board and the planning board makes a recommendation to the council as to whether or not the amendment should pass or not. We are not the final authority on whether an amendment to an ordinance happens and so uh, with that being said, everyone needs to understand that whatever we do is strictly an amendment to the council. Uh, the council is the final legislative authority on whether or not the ordinance is amended or not in relation to uh, the issue that's at hand. So just to make that clear, um, just because the planning board recommended to the council that this change not be made, it is still up to the council legislatively to decide whether or not the change in the zoning will happen. And so I just wanted to make that clear for the record. Um, and, and additionally, all I'll say is what the planning board's general consensus was on this issue is that because it probably had some far reaching implications, uh, I think the planning board was inclined and initially from the beginning along with the zoning ordinance uh, revision committee felt that this was an issue that would be better left to the zoning or to the long range planning committee, excuse me, uh, upon taking up uh, provisions of the new comprehensive plan. And so basically that's where the planning board was coming from. Uh, let's wait to see what the long range planning committee says about uh, zoning in general, uh, and more specifically about zoning in that area of the, of the flag pond road. So thank you members of the council and Mr. Mayor, I just wanted to make that clear for the record. Thank you, Don. Uh, 
up next we have uh, Zoom identifier, Victoria. Victoria, you've been allowed to unmute. Please go ahead and do so. State your name and address for the record and present your comments to the city council. Thank you. My name is Victoria Frankel, address 126 Flag Pond Road. Just real briefly, I wanted to echo Cassandra Collins' um, most recent comments and um, thanks um, to Mr. Schinberg for addressing some of our concerns. Um, additionally, I, I would just like to mention, yeah, we're all pretty well aware of the zoning um, in the areas surrounding our neighborhood, which frankly for me is all the more reason to keep residential with residential and industrial with industrial. Those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you. And up next, we have Zoom identifier Greg, Greg Shinberg. Greg, you've been allowed to, to unmute. Please go ahead and do so. State your name and address for the record and present your comments to the city council. Hi, Greg Shinberg again. And I just wanted to uh, briefly um, respond to one comment or question made earlier about um, why it's coming back. And I appreciated Mr. Gerard explaining so well the process of everything, the one thing that we did change and really listen carefully to the uh, planning board was one of the biggest concerns they raised was the line of sight distance from the middle of the bridge coming over the highway to where the entrance to a driveway would be. And with that being a 300 and now 90 foot uh, distance used to be 350 when we were out there several times, we realized that this is going to be difficult. It's a 35 mile an hour speed limit. You're coming downhill. People tend to go faster. These comments were all shared at the, at the planning board. So what is different is that we then realized it would be better to ask for the entire parcel, not just part of that parcel where the house is, to be industrial so that during a planning board review process, and site plan review, the road and the traffic issues, the site plan issues could all be better addressed. And so what's changed from the planning board? Um, the request at planning board was only a part of the parcel to be changed. And we realized it would be better for, pub for safety reasons than others to make this change. We were thinking, well, try to bring it back because it might create more buffer but that seemed to be less important than creating the line of sight safety issues. And you can create a good buffer with screening and transplanting trees and whatnot. So uh, I, uh, not to say it's not legitimate, but this is a little bit of the evolution of what happened. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Up next, we have Zoom identifier Katrina. Katrina, you've been allowed to unmute. Please go ahead and do so. State your name and address for the record and present your comments to the city council. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's Katrina Batello of 116 Flag Pond Road. Um, and I know that um, I may have jumped on a, a moment late and I heard Mr. Schinberg's comments about the sight line. I guess my concern is that the process, um, I, I feel like the sight line should be addressed before the rezoning. Um, you can't, um, I mean, you, you can do whatever you want, but um, I do second Victoria's thoughts about um, slowing this down and also keep industrial with industrial. We bought our homes on Flag Pond. We know our backyards are industrial and that I can get into the master plan development down the line. Um, but there's no need to rezone um, the residential to be industrial so that one person can have access. And I understand that the Clarks are trying to build some or put, put some trees in um, but those trees have been there for a long time. And so cutting down trees and putting in some couple saplings just doesn't really um, suffice. Um, and all I would like to say is that a moratorium, not a moratorium, but um, delaying this so we can get more of an understanding of the Clarks and of, of what the plan is and more of an understanding is all I'm really asking for. Um, it's my neighborhood and I'm sure that you would all feel the same 
if this was happening a couple doors down from you as well. So I would just like you to think about, you know, it's, it's our neighborhood. So that's, that's mostly what I would like to say right now. And um, yeah, I'll leave it at that for now. I may chime in later. Thank you. Thank you, Katrina. Yep. There are no other hands raised. Councilor McPhail. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move to close the public hearing and to schedule the second and final reading for the zoning amendment for the parcels on Flag Pond Road, previously zoned low density residential to be rezoned to industrial for March 22nd, 2021. Motion's been made by Councilor McPhail. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councillor Purdy. Any discussion on closing the public hearing and setting the second and final reading for March 22nd? A roll call vote, Councillor Archer. Aye. Councillor Purdy. Yes. Councillor Gunn. Yes. Councillor Berman. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Berman. Councillor McPhail? Yes. Thank you, Councillor Johnston? Yes. Thank you. The motion passes 6 0 to close the public hearing at 8 22 and set final reading for March 22nd. That moves us on to what was uh, item F, uh, and now will become item H. And that is one reading, an update to the fee schedule for impoundment fees. Council Archer. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the City of Saco Dark Gordon at 64 Tax 7 impoundment fee allows for the Council to update the impoundment fee and boarding fee for dogs. These fees are located in the City of Saco Fee and Penalty Schedule, Chapter 64 Animals. The current fee is $25 for each dog impound impoundment and $4 per day uh, per dog per day for boarding. Each year, the city council will review such fees and update the penalty fees for dog ordinance 64 tax seven impoundment fee, be it ordered that the city council approves keeping the current impoundment fee at $25 for dogs and the boarding fee at $4 per day, per dog per day. I move to approve the order. Motion's been made by Council Archer. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilor Purdy. Discussion? Seeing no discussion, roll call vote. Councilor Archer? Aye. Councilor Purdy? Yes. Councilor Gunn? Yes. Councilor Berman? Yes. Councilor McPhail? Yes. Councilor Johnston? Yes. Motion passes 6 0. Thank you. That moves us to uh, item, what was item G, and is now item I. And that is one reading. Uh, pilot policy, and that's Councilor Purdy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Payment in lieu of taxes with the pilot program is a structured way for municipalities to seek payments from tax exempt property owners. Service charges may be billed to tax exempt properties that are used to provide rental income per 36 MRSA, Section 508. Service charges were adopted under Chapter 192 of the City Code in 1989. However, a dedicated policy is necessary to ensure equitable enforcement. Uh, be it ordered that the City Council approve the new pilot policy. I move to approve the order. Motion's been made by Councilor Purdy. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilor Berman. Discussion? Councilor Purdy. Thank you. Um, my question, as I was reading over this, at first I thought it was simply uh, um, the reports generated by the finance department were going to be informational for city staff. Um, as I read it, I was rereading it. I was wondering, are the are these formulas going to be used to... Uh, calculate the or re, 
refigure, recalculate the um, the pilot agreements that we have with existing entities in SACO. Council of Party, we are promoting Finance Director Salas uh, to answer your question. Thank you. Finance Director Salas, greetings and welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I apologize, my mic is, there we go. Were, were you able to hear Councilor Purdy's question? I was. Um, so there's two pieces to the, to the pilot policy. Um, the first is calculating um, service fee costs for all tax exempt properties. That's the informational piece. Uh, the second piece is to calculate service fees for tax exempt properties that are obligated to pay a service fee under chapter 192, I believe is the, is the um, city code. And that city code is per main state statute, which allows municipalities to charge a service fee to tax exempt properties whose primary income generation is rental income. Again, the idea is you have residents, they're going to generate more against the tax rate than, let's say, a church building, which is only open once a week. Um, so what this does, in the past, um, the ordinance has always stated that uh, the service charges should be based on a calculation of service fees. Um, however, in past practice, because there wasn't a policy in place, typically what happened was that uh, 2% was 2% of the rental income per the nonprofit's uh, financial statements is what was billed. So we're trying to move away from that because that wasn't technically what the ordinance says and it's not what state statute says. The state statute mandates that it be based on an actual calculation of police, fire, public works, that kind of thing. So that's why you have a calculation in there and it will be used um, to calculate service charges but only for those tax exempt properties that owe service fees to the city based on chapter 192. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, hearing no other questions. A roll call vote on the pilot policy. Council Archer? Aye. Council Purdy? Yes. Council Gunn? Yes. Council Berman? Yes. Council McPhail? Yes. Council Johnston? Yes. Motion passes 6 0. Uh, that brings us to what was item H and is now item J. That is one reading grants policy, and that is Council of Purdy. Thank you. In January, the Finance Department completed an ambitious review of all internal procedures in need of policy coverage. Grants were highlighted as an item that needed more careful consideration and tracking. The city auditor also recommended a process change as part of the annual audit. Finally, the Finance Department felt it prudent to have guidance in place for city funded grants coming out of the expanded TIF development program. We had ordered the city council approve the new grants policy. I move to approve the order. Motion has been made by Councillor Birdie, second by Councillor Johnston. Discussion on the grants policy. Uh, hearing no discussion, nobody seeking recognition. A roll call vote on the grants policy. Councilor Archer? Aye. Councilor Purdy? Yes. Councilor Gunn? Yes. Councilor Berman? 
Yes. Councilor McPhail? Yes. Councilor Johnston? Yes. Motion passes 6 0. Moving on to item I, which is now item K. Uh, one reading post issuance compliance policy, and that is Councilor Purdy. In January, the Finance Department completed an ambitious review of all internal procedures in need of policy coverage. A post issuance compliance policy was recommended to the City of Saco by its bond agent and bond council as a way to potentially improve the city's bond rating and generate favorable interest rates. This post issuance compliance policy ensures full compliance with all applicable regulations for tax exempt bond, bond issue, issuances. The language has been reviewed by the city's bond council to ensure full, full legal compliance. Be it ordered the city council approves the new post issuance compliance policy. I move to approve the order. Second. Motion has been made by Councillor Purdy, second by Councillor Johnston. Discussion on the post issuance compliance policy. Seeing no hands raised and no counselor seeking recognition, a roll call vote on the, the post issuance compliance policy. Councilor Archer? Aye. Councilor Purdy? Yes. Councilor Gunn? Yes. Councilor Berman? Yes. Councilor McPhail? Yes. Councilor Johnston? Yes. Motion passes 6 0. Moving on to Item J, or what was item J, now item L, and that's one reading, capital improvement policy revisions, and that is Councilor Purdy. In December, the Finance Department completed an ambitious review of all existing policies. This, this revised capital improvement policy reflects minor revisions made necessary by the changes to Chapter 15 of the City Code and the new grants policy. Uh, be it ordered, the City Council approves the re revision to the City of Saco's capital improvement policy. I, I move to approve the order. Motion's been made by Councilor Purdy. Is there a second? Second. Keeping up the trend, Councilor Johnston. I told you I'm all about consistency. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Seeing no hands raised and no counselor seeking recognition or roll call vote. Council Archer? Aye. Councilor Purdy? Yes. Councilor Gunn? Yes. Councilor Berman? Yes. Councilor McPhail? Yes. Councilor Johnston? Yes. Motion passes 6 0. Moving on to item 10, which is new business, uh, and that is item A. Technical Design Standards Construction Manual. Mr. Mayor, we should be promoting uh, City Engineer Joe Laverrier for this item. Thank you. City Engineer Laverrier, thank you for joining us. Greetings and welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. So the item before us is the adoption of technical design standards for the construction manual. Uh, what would you like to tell the council about this as far as the presentation? <clears throat> um, this is actually something we talked about with the planning board probably about two years ago. And it was before the, the last year's effort to redo zoning, subdivision, site plan ordinances. And uh, the thought again, you know, two years ago, which is where we you know, moved along today, is to try to pull a lot of the construction standards that were buried in various different sections of the ordinance. Um, some relatively easy to find, some not so relatively easy to find, but try to get them all into one location where a developer or an engineer that comes into the city to do a project is more readily 
available to find what our standards are. And um, <clears throat> over the years, some of the things that were in those subdivision regulations in particular had just become a little bit outdated. Um, you know, one example is uh, curb type materials. I think, you know, some of you will notice that the city over the years has used a lot now of slip form concrete curb. And <clears throat> uh, that wasn't even in our uh, ordinances at the, the, the ones that are in a place technically today. And it's just a function of, you know, times have changed. Some of how we do things have changed and, and we uh, didn't really have a lot of that in our standards as they were written down. So essentially as developers came in, we would be trying to go through some of the things that are different, how we do things today. And so that was what the goal was, was to try to get them all updated and get them in one uh, easy to find location. So that's really what it, what it was all about. Uh, and then when they went through the process of uh, obviously the pretty extensive rewrite of ordinances, site plan, subdivision, um, we just try to push that along to get it done. So now it just references this manual um, as a place to go find that information. That's all I have for you. Happy Jeez. to answer questions. Thank you very much uh, for that. Council, any questions uh, for City Engineer Laveria? Council Archer? So what I'm hearing is pretty much a Cliff's Notes for our developers. Uh, yeah, I mean, again, we it, it covers it. Right now, there's... The, 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 again, I think we have plans eventually to continue to expand this. For instance, uh, pump stations is down at the water resource recovery. There'll be a chapter eventually added to this is where we would like to go at some point, but that would be a future amendment. We did not have that chapter uh, done at this point in time. Uh, so we've, we've covered basically what has was always in uh, the subdivision regs with respect to roads, sidewalks, uh, sewers, storm drains, um, and we added the chapter about uh, water quality or stormwater uh, management provisions. So, but yes, it is basically a cliff note for the developers. And the second part is, I I, I like what I see, so, so that makes it nice and easy. Um, but it, it, can there be some kind of statement stating that this does not, uh, you still have to go to the law, the ordinance? Some kind of saying that this is a this is here for your reference, but uh, in the end, it's the city ordinance that needs to matter. Just in case we update something and the manual doesn't get updated, updated. Um, in time, there's always that that happens. Um, I love what I see, uh, but I also want to protect the city. Just saying, hey, city rules ordinances will always apply over the manual. Yep, that's fine. I can work with Bob about what we might do. We could probably add something in that preamble section to that effect, if, you, if you'd like. Um, I think what you'll find is that if you're in the site plan subdivision uh, regs, it, it, it does the kind of the, the, the complementary to what you're saying is mm -hmm. it refers them to this manual uh, to find that information. So we certainly can do the same thing in reverse back. So, mm -hmm. yep. Thank you, Council Archer. Any further questions for City Engineer Leverrier? Councilor Johnston. No, no questions. Just um, you know, great job. I know this was a an arduous task, and it's definitely more clear and concise than the way it was all laid out everywhere before. So, great job to both you and Emily. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Johnston. Any. Further discussion? I'm not hearing any objections. So, Council, you'll see this on a uh, upcoming agenda. Council Archer, you are uh, noted as the Council Liaison. Are you willing to be the liaison for this? Yeah, not a problem. Definitely. Thank you. City Engineer Laveria, thank you very much for joining us this evening uh, and, and providing us that presentation and for all your hard work. You're more than welcome. Thank you. Uh, with that, we are at item B of new business, that is TIF and SIA guidelines. And I believe we will be getting a update and a presentation from Economic Development Director Clavette and Economic Development Specialist uh, 
Jessa, Barna. They've both been promoted. Greetings and welcome. Thank you for joining us. And Thank we're, you. we're ready to learn all about uh, TIFs and SIA guidelines uh, and changes. Sure. Great. Um, and I will turn this over to Jessa, who's been working on this uh, project extensively. And um, this has also been through our Economic Development Advisory Board as well. Um, I have a very brief presentation. Um, if you don't mind, I just want to share my screen. Can you see that? We can see your screen. Okay, thank you. Um, and if I look to the side, it's because I'm looking at my other monitor. Um, so um, just to give you a little background on these TIF and CEA guidelines, um, at the request of council and the EDC, staff's been updating um, these guidelines. The current policy, which is titled Development Districts and Tax Increment Financing, were adopted by the council in 97 and revised in 2016. Um, I know that perennially, as we go through adopting a CEA, uh, CEA in particular, it comes up sometimes that maybe these guidelines need updated. So it's something that's been on our radar for a while, and now it's a good time to act on it. Um, these draft guidelines were reviewed by our TIF attorney, Shauna Cook Mueller, and um, on Monday, February 22nd, the EDC did unanimously vote to recommend um, the adoptions of these guidelines um, in the form presented tonight. So some of the goals of these changes, as I mentioned, it's come up periodically um, that they do need to be updated. Um, the purpose is to provide more clarity, transparency, and equity in the process of establishing new TIF districts and is issuing credit enhancement agreements. Um, this policy also provides a clear process for issuing TIFs and CEAs and outlines the eligibility, general priorities for the city um, to consider in the approval. Um, some of the key details um, in this policy, we have kind of, it's addressing two things that are pretty different from each other. One is the, the establishing of a TIF district, um, which is much more general. And I, you know, we've been over this a number of times in terms of the importance of having the TIF districts as sort of a tax sheltering tool and um, just providing funds for some different types of projects. So one is about establishing that and then a credit enhancement agreement is more more into for a specific project in terms of getting money back to support that project. So these guidelines work hard to sort of pull those apart and make sure that we're addressing um, the goals for each of those separately. Um, so some of the guiding principles that we've provided are to, um, and I'm kind of improvising is to support city plans and policies, stimulate the tax base, create and retain quality employment opportunities, encourage housing and invest in infrastructure improvements. Um, this policy also provides a clear process for enacting the TIF. It also has a thousand dollar fee, which is something that's new. Um, that's something that if a developer say comes in to do a TIF and a CEA together, then they would have to first apply for the TIF. If the city is creating a TIF like we recently did with a transit oriented TIF, that would not apply. Um, and then there would be a separate fee for the CEA um, after the TIF is formed. Um, and then this policy also outlines uh, three of the three TIF expenditures, one being municipal economic development programs funded directly um, through um, annual fund request for appropriations. The second is projects financed by city bond or debt issuance. And the third is CAs, which we'll um, go into more in just a moment. Um, so in issuing a CEA, um, we kind of have struggled in the past because some, there's some requirements that are very prescriptive, some that are very broad. Is it a policy? Is it more guidelines? And so we tried to hit the balance of giving clear enough guidelines to make a decision without really strapping us in if something comes up before us that is that we really do want to support, but that maybe we hadn't foreseen. So some of the general, the general priorities that we've outlined in this draft include creating new jobs, assisting existing businesses to retain jobs, create significant long-term employment, create or expand public infrastructure um, beyond projects, support and emerging business sectors, introduce a new a unique or prestigious opportunity. Now that's something new that we added as um, we've seen some of these examples come up before where maybe it's not the biggest company, but it is something that's really interesting and unique that we want to really support in SACO. So we added that from the current ones. Um, improve the local economy, broaden the tax base, improve blighted areas, support community projects, and create a public benefit 
um, for workers and businesses. Um, again, the CEA, like with the TIF pro project, provides a clear process for how you have to establish the district. Um, there are some very basic eligibility requirements, um, but then on top of that, there's more detailed guidelines to help the city determine, okay, we, if we want to support the CEA, they meet the eligibility requirements, but how much do we fund this, this um, CEA? Because there's a lot of discretion in that actual level of funding. So this provides sort of a framework to help the council make that decision. And then there's also um, a section on transfer of ownership, because um, if you change businesses and hands, there, that does need to be addressed legally. Um, so that's just kind of a quick overview of what's in the policy. We're looking for any feedback tonight. Um, again, we're trying to make this policy a little clearer, more transparent, and also give the appropriate amount of guide guidance um, to the council as we move forward with these decisions. Thank you, Jessa. Uh, one thing, did during your uh, discussion, I seem to remember, and I'm just looking back at the meeting minutes and the agenda from our, our April 3rd, 2017 council meeting, where we did update the um, development district and tax increment financing guidelines uh, in 2017 uh, during an April meeting. Uh, did When you were doing your... Um, when you were gathering the information for your presentation, are we working off of those amended guidelines or, or cause I know there was some confusion on guidelines with the uh, changing of uh, economic development directors. Um, so I just wanna make sure we're using the, the most recent uh, documents when we're preparing to move something forward. So yeah. just a question, I don't, you don't have to, be on the spot right at the moment. Uh, I don't want to do that. Uh, uh, just if you could take a look at that. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not as 100% positive. I will check on that. And before we bring it back to make a motion to adopt, make sure that we're adopting from the most recent for sure. Thank you very much. And, and like I said, that was uh, April 3rd, uh, 2017. Uh, Council okay. Minthorn made the motion. I seconded and the motion uh, was approved. Uh, after some amendments. Great. It, it was a pass uh, with seven yeas. One of the things, Mayor, if I could add um, to this is this represents a consolidation and a compilation of existing past policies and some other guideline documents that were created throughout the state in various communities. Um, and, and this, what you're going to be looking at, I know that we the conversation between policy and guideline. These are a set of guidelines as opposed to policy. Um, and the importance to understand the difference between the two is that it leaves a little bit more flexibility in making decisions rather than um, somebody meet criteria A, B, C, D, E, F, G. It basically, as long as they meet the majority, um, enough of a matrix, because um, we'll be designing a matrix type of evaluative tool to be able to have these evaluated. So you just can't come in and say, we want a TIF, or we want a credit enhancement agreement. They will have to meet these guidelines. Um, so um, that's that's the primary difference between the two. The other one is is the, the original set of documents that were created were very financially driven and written by, um, you know, to be evaluated financially. And that component of those guidelines that and policies that were created in years past will be passed on to Southern agencies so we can maintain uh, business confidentiality and they have the qualifications to actually ascertain whether they uh, move forward as, as a, a solvent business. Um, and those financial documents are not part of the public record. They have to sign off for if they are actually financially sound and able to uh, move forward as a business. Thank you, Director Clavet. Any other questions for Director Clavet or uh, Economic Development Specialist Berna? Okay. So, Council, you'll see this on a agenda, an upcoming agenda, uh, if there's no objection. Fair enough. 
Uh, moving on to uh, Director Clavet, Specialist Berna, thank you very much for joining us this evening and all for all your hard work uh, on the presentation to wrap in all of our guidelines into one document. So thank you very much. Uh, have a thank great you, evening. Uh, that brings us to item 11 on the agenda, which is the administrative updates to the Administrator Canrath. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just to hit again on the Ward 5 Council appointment, the city is currently accepting letters of interest from residents of Ward 5 who wish to be considered for the Ward 5 appointment. They will be accepted until March 24th in our city clerk's office. Um, uh, just to be clear on the process, which was already uh, told, but it will be the exact same process as we just had for the Ward, ward 4 vacancy. So all applicants, all candidates will be considered by the council in public session. Um, for a presentation before the council before an actual appointment is made. So again, that was March 24th uh, at the close of business, uh, 5 p.m. with the city clerk's office to file. Uh, just to update again on uh, the Army Corps of Engineers project. As you know, we're currently waiting to hear back from the Army Corps um, on our letter of support. We have not yet, but in the meantime, we are going to go ahead and draft uh, another letter just in case. Uh, we need to file another letter of support with them, and that will be for council consideration. We're just going to have the letter ready if you so choose to consider it. Um, just so we're prepared to move that process forward as quickly as possible uh, if we need to and not waste any more time. Uh, senior meals program with Parks and Rec. We had an event last week on March 4th that did 250 meals again, which was incredible. So thank you to Parks and Rec and all the volunteers there for making that happen. Our next date will be in early April to coincide with the Easter holiday. So more details to come on that. Um, I assume by next week, I'll have the um, exact date and time for, for that next meals program event. Um, just another quick note. I recently met with Dan Shadborn, our Harbor master, to discuss some needed repairs down at the Camp Bellas Pier. Um, we're gonna be doing some work on the boat ramp, the hoist and some other minor repairs uh, in the area to get things ready for the summer season. Um, and just to be on notice, we may be looking at some more extensive repairs or replacement of the boat ramp um, in a future year uh, coming up. But uh, it was good to see Dan and hopefully work through some of those issues and get everything ready for um, the spring and summer, which is just around the corner. So that's all I have. Thank you. Have you taken any questions? Thank you, City Administrator Canrath. Any questions for the City Administrator? Okay, moving on to item 12 of the agenda, council discussion and comment. Any council discussion and comment? Moving on, uh, is there a motion? What should be uh, item 13 on the agenda? Uh, is there a motion to enter executive session? Councilor McPhail. Be it ordered that the city council enter into executive session pursuant to MRSA Title I, Chapter 13, Subchapter 1, Section 4056, Personnel Matters. Motion's been made by Councilor McPhail. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilor Purdy. Any discussion? A roll call vote. Councilor. Archer? Aye. Councilor Purdy? Yes. Councilor Gunn? Yes. Councilor Berman? Yes. Councilor McPhail? Yes. Councilor Johnston? Yes. Motion passes 6 0 to enter executive session at 8 54 p.m. Uh, folks, please migrate over to the uh, Zoom link you were provided by City Administrator Kaner. We will take a five minute recess in between, five minute recess in between. Uh, so please migrate over there, but feel free to take five minutes for yourself.
Okay, welcome back everyone. Uh, we're at item 14 on the agenda, a uh, report from executive session. Is there a motion to come out of executive session? So moved. Councilor Johnston, is there a second to come out of executive session? Second. Second by Councilor Purdy. Uh, on coming out of executive session, any discussion? A roll call vote, Councilor Archer? Aye. Councilor Purdy? Yes. Councilor Gunn? Yes. Councilor Berman? Yes. Councilor McPhail? Yes. Councilor Johnston? Yes. The motion to come out of executive session passes 6 0 at 9 54 p.m. Uh, any report from executive session? No report. Council Archer says no report from executive session. Uh, at this time, we are moving on to item 15 on the agenda, which is adjournment. Uh, Council, I do want to say uh, that I, 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 I missed back early on. Uh, there was uh, a first meeting of the Mayor's Arts Commission. Uh, it was held on Thursday uh, of last week, and I will give everybody an update um, at the next council meeting on that. Uh, so uh, please forgive me there. Uh, with that, uh, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Councilor Johnston, is there a second? Second. Second by Councilor Berman. Uh, discussion on adjournment? A roll call vote on adjournment. Council Archer? Aye. Councilor Purdy? Yes. Councilor Gunn? Yes. Councillor Berman? Yes. Councillor McPhail? Yes. Councillor Johnston? Yes. Motion passes 6 0 to adjourn at 9 55 p.m. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great evening. Be well Thank and you. stay safe. Good night. Good night.